As I mentioned first service, I just want to uh, really kind of share a, a basic message as we move toward the Lord's table of, um, of entitled Jesus, Our Replacement, and just to give us an idea of, of really what the Lord's table is about and what, what God the Father has done for us through his Son, Jesus Christ. Um, I don't know if I have the energy to do it the same way in the second, so I just feel exhausted after the first service. It must be my age. It's just, you know, when you cross that divide, it's 60, 62, you know. But, uh, yeah, I just pray for, for grace and strength to communicate again this morning. But my heart's excited as well. As I said in the first service, you know, sometimes we forget really the wonder, the miracle of what this book, the Bible, really is. And when you do a little study of how the Bible came to us, you soon realize that the Bible itself was actually written over a period of 1,500 years. For those who may not be familiar, someone didn't just sit down and write a book called the Bible. This Bible is a compilation actually of 40 different authors over that span of 1,500 years. Those 40 different authors lived on three different continents at different times and spoke three different languages. And yet God was able to take all of that and compile it into one book. And if you read this book, one thing you see is that there is an uninterrupted theme. It doesn't contradict. It is steady from book to book to book. And this entire book speaks about God's amazing plan to actually save mankind, you and me, from the consequences of our sin from the consequences of our wrong choices, what we have done. And so the Lord has given us this book for us to cherish. In fact, it's unfortunate, but in the Western culture, oftentimes we've grown so accustomed to this book that we probably have 10 or 15 hidden somewhere in our libraries and bookshelves and bedrooms, and they're just collecting dust. I just think of believers around the world who don't have the scriptures. I saw a little uh, Instagram post just this past week or wherever it was, and it was just a little uh, uh, Latina girl. She might have been like seven or eight years old, and, and her grandmother gave her her very first Bible. And it just warmed my heart as this little girl, when she saw the Bible, there were no other gifts, when she saw the Bible, she just began to weep and weep and weep for joy for what God's Word means. And, and I trust that God's Word will maybe afresh have that same sense of meaning for us as well today as we look at, uh, at what it teaches us on this matter. The Bible also reveals to you and me that God loves us so much more than we could ever fathom. And in his love, he created us with what we call free will. What that means is that he didn't create us to be robots. He didn't impose on us a will to love him and say, you have no choice. I'm God. You're not. You'll do what I say. But rather what he did, he gave us free will because he wants us to love him out of a genuine understanding of his great love for us. He just wants us to be able to reciprocate that love. God is not a God who says, I am God, you will love me. God is a God who says, you can love me because I've first loved you. I've shown you what love is, and all I'm inviting you to do is to respond to that love and to learn to walk in a loving relationship with the God who made us. He doesn't ask us just to obey rules. He doesn't ask us to follow some kind of religion. We all, we all know this. We say it many, many times. But what did he create us for? He created us for relationship. Now, in the book of Genesis, we read the story of when God first made mankind, Adam and Eve. And he said this to them in chapter 2. He said, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Now, in our human understanding sometimes, we can read that story and think, well, did God put the tree in the garden to tempt man? And the answer is no. He didn't put it in the garden to tempt Adam and Eve. He put it there to give them a free choice. And he said, listen, you don't have to follow me. I'm going to show you what's going on around you. There is good, there is evil, but whatever you do, I don't want you to partake in evil. So he says, if you eat of that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. Now, once again, in our human understanding, we tend to look at that and say, well, it seems like God was holding out on them. In fact, that's the lie the devil used to confuse Adam and Eve and ultimately make them or convince them that they needed to partake of that tree. The thousands or millions of trees in the garden, they could have anything they want except for that one tree. So he convinces them that God was holding something back. And we can think that as well. We can read that story and think, well, what's wrong with the knowledge of good and evil? Well, knowledge in the biblical context is not just knowing about something. It's actually experiencing it. That's why the scripture talks about a man and a woman knowing each other is talking about that physical intimacy where they become one. And what God is saying is that tree, in eating of that tree, you will experience for yourself what evil is. I don't want you to experience that. 
But I have to give you the option. If not, again, you'll just be robots. You have to willfully, of your own free will, choose to love me and return my love with which I love you. It's your choice. And so, again, you know, people kind of look at that and say, well, God's holy. No, but really, when you think of it, it's no different than you and me as parents. With you and me as parents, we understand there is good in the world and there is evil in the world. But who of us, as loving, rational parents, would say to our child, listen, I want to make sure that you experience life to the full. I don't want you to miss out on anything, so here, do evil. Would we do that? Of course we wouldn't do that. What do we do? In love for our children, we make them aware that there is evil, but we say, listen, I don't want you to do those evil things or be involved in those things. Why? Because I want you to live in everything that goodness can bring you. It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm sheltered because I know there's evil but don't participate in it. It just means I'm wise. There are a lot of things as a young person growing up, and I've said this before, we're playing sports at different levels. There was always parties. There was always alcohol. There was always drugs, all that kind of stuff. I wasn't a goody two-shoes in that sense or better than anybody else. But as a believer, I had a common sense of looking at uh, the results of a lot of my friends partying and realized logically, I just don't want that. Like, I'm not missing out on anything. Certainly the hangovers and the mistakes and the drugs. And in fact, we came back, they played in the Nationals and lacrosse. When I was a teenager, I came back, and the next day, everybody went out and had a party, and two of my best friends on the team were killed in a car accident. So I knew, as a young man, I'm not missing out. I'm actually free to be able to say no. In fact, I ran into some guys from the team when I came back from college one year, and, and a couple of the guys said, Paul, listen, I know we gave you a hard time sometimes, and we teased you and everything else, but they said, inside, we wished we had the same courage you did to say no. We didn't want to do it. But we just felt compelled, we felt peer pressure, we had to do that. So I always felt as a believer that I knew there were things out there that were not good, but I never felt I was missing out because I knew the right choices actually brought life and goodness. Does that make sense? And so the Lord has the same desire for you and me. The knowledge of good and evil, he says, I want to keep you from experiencing the evil because I don't want you to go out and sow your wild oats and then all, all the years that follow have scars and damage and all these things you have to repair. I want to free you from that, just like any good parent wants to do for their own child. Well, when you read the story, we know that Adam and Eve ended up believing the lie, and they died spiritually. What that means is, is the relationship with God was severed. That spiritual connection was lost. And then later on, of course, they died physically because of the sin they brought into the world set in motion the process of decay and death. Now, that same evil was also passed on to their children, their children, down through the millennia, down to you and me. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, when Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. Adam's sin spread death throughout all the world, so everything began to grow old and die for all sin. That's why I'm 62 and tired. Now, whew, okay. So God loves the world so much that he wanted to forgive mankind, and he wanted to spare mankind the consequences of his sin. But God is also perfectly fair and just. And so what does he have to do? He has to require that the penalty for that sin be paid. Now, again, in our humanness, we tend to think, you know, in very twisted, crazy ways, and we just kind of think, well, why doesn't God just let us slide? But we wouldn't ask that of our regular judici uh, human judicial system either. What would we think if, if, and we're seeing some of this lived out in some of the states in the U.S., but what would we think if criminals were brought before the judge and the judge just said, ah, oh, that's no big deal. You go your separate way. That person might get off, but what do they do? They return to society and offend again, right? It's kind of, you've heard of some of the crazy laws in the states that there's no prosecution. If you only steal less than $950, you're okay. What does this say to the criminal? Woo! -hoo! Right? Every single day, $950. do not go over. Don't be greedy, but $950. I can walk in the stores fill the garbage bags, and we're good. And that just creates mayhem, right? And innocent people suffer. So none of us would want to tolerate that, and yet sometimes it seems like we expect the same thing of God. But God is perfectly just. Sin must be punished. But here's the dilemma. How can God forgive us, set us free, love, while sentences us to death to satisfy justice at the same time? And you see, the Bible says that's where Satan thought he had God over a barrel. That's where he thought, okay, checkmate, because I know God loves these people he made, but I've caused them to sin. They've fallen from God. I know God is just. He cast me out of heaven when I rebelled. I know God is just. He's going to have to do the same to them. So checkmate. There's nowhere God can move. 
But we know in reading the scriptures that God actually had a plan that Satan could never imagine. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, none of the rulers of this world knew this wisdom. If they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would not have crucified Jesus. Now, God had a plan that would reconcile love and justice. So here's a dilemma for the human race. God loves us and wants to forgive us and spare us from the consequences of our sin. But justice says, I must be punished for my sin. The problem is, the penalty for my sin is death. If I pay for my own sin, which I'm allowed to, it means I have to pay with my life. And if I pay with my life, it means the justice is satisfied, but now I am forever separated from God for eternity. I can't remember if I said it in this service or last, but the reality is this. God said through the cross, through Jesus, I love you too much to bear the thought of you spending eternity without you. So I'm going to do something to actually save you, to actually offer a remedy to this situation. And so Psalm 85 says this. Unfailing love, grace, mercy, and truth, justice, reality, have met together. Say the rest with me. Righteousness and peace have kissed. That is the miracle of the plan that God came up with. And that is why I don't say this as a pastor. I say this as an ordinary, ordinary human being who years ago looked at different faiths, different belief systems, and came to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is the only way for salvation. There is no other true religion in the world. Now you say, Pastor, that sounds like a pretty, you know, whatever, remarkable statement to make, but I'll tell you why I know this. The plan that God devised for our salvation through Jesus Christ is a plan that no human being would ever thought of. It would never have crossed our mind how to reconcile those two things. And the reason I know this is because there is no other religion or belief system in the entire world that has this same idea. Every other religion, every other God, every other deity, every other system, what does it require? It requires human works. It requires that somehow you earn your salvation. Somehow you pay for your debt. Am I wrong? Right? I'm not just saying that, you know, as a Christian, that's the reality. Study world religion. And in fact, let me tell you this. One of the earmarks as a Christian that you really don't know Christ, but that you've just embraced a religion is when you fall into a belief system as a progressive, uh, professing Christian, a belief system which fundamentally goes back to works. When you don't understand what it really means to be forgiven of your sin, when you don't understand the price Jesus really paid for you and how free you are, but rather you sit back into a mindset that really has no confidence with God, that doesn't really know, well, I don't think I can talk to God today because I did something wrong yesterday. Or, or there's that whole merit, that human works. If you've fallen into that, it doesn't mean you've lost your salvation, but it means you've slipped into religion. You've slipped into man's way of thinking about things. You need to get a hold of God's word. You need to hear what the word of God says to you, speak truth into your life, set you free again, and get you back on track. Because you can waste a whole lot of time feeling disqualified or for some reason feeling that you're less than when God says, listen to me, look in my eyes, you are my child. Now start living like it. Another topic. Okay, so what did God do? God, through a man named Abraham, rose up a nation called Israel, the Jewish people. And to that nation, he gave to them a system of sacrifices and festivals in order to show the whole world and to show his people how he was going to reconcile these two problems, how he was going to bring them together. God said to Moses in Leviticus 23, he said, announce to the people of Israel that they are to celebrate several annual feasts of the Lord, times when all Israel will assemble and worship me. Now, it's important to understand, when you look at the feasts of Israel, the sacrificial systems, these were not religious ceremonies. They can become religious ceremonies, just like us can gather on a Sunday, and this can just be a religious thing we go through if we want to do that. But that was not God's intent. All of these festivals were meant to be dramatic enactments for the world to see how God was going to solve this problem of actually loving mankind and saving mankind on the one hand, and then on the other hand, exacting the punishment from man that he deserves. 
So the Jewish people understood this. When they came together with their sacrificial system and feasts, they knew these feasts were not the solution. They were only a picture of the solution that would come. And the prophets, over the years, prophesied about a person who would actually fulfill all of these things that were being played out in all of this drama. Now, the apostle Paul put it this way, looking back, he said in Colossians 2, these are only shadows of the reality yet to come. Christ himself is the, the reality. Jesus so, by the time Jesus arrived ago, on this earth 2,000 years ago, these festivals, this drama, had already been playing years. out so for some Jesus 1,200 came, years. So when Jesus came, anyone who had an eye to see could see that he was the one who, who, uh, for who, he was, who he was, rather, and what it was that he came to do. So it wasn't a great mystery. All these festivals and feasts and so on, they pointed to what would be fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And anyone who was a student of the word and many who were began to follow Jesus because they all lined up to what they see being fulfilled in him. Now, there are two prophetic dramas played out on the cross. We know that Jesus died on the cross, but there are two prophetic things that prove to us that Jesus Christ was actually our replacement. The first one, was on the Day of Atonement. Atonement was one of the feasts, one of the festivals. On the Day of Atonement, what they were to do is to choose two goats, with oat blemish spotless, two goats. On that day, one goat was to be sacrificed. Its blood was taken into a small chamber in the temple called the Holy of Holies, where God's literal presence dwelt. No man could enter except the high priest once a year. The blood was brought into the Holy of Holies, and it was sprinkled in what was called the mercy and so the seat. Mercy seat was, was and so the mercy seat was, blood, was being sprinkled with the blood, meaning that because blood was shed to cover man's sin for that season, then God could show mercy to them. So that was the first goat. The second goat the high priest would take, lay his hands upon it, and confess the sins of the nation for that year. Then that goat was taken into the wilderness where it was, you might say, pardoned. It was released. It was allowed to run and so free. And so what you have is these two goats that were called one offering. That's very important. It wasn't two offerings. It was one offering because in that one offering of one life being taken to cover the sin, and because of that, the other life being allowed to go free, God was showing this beautiful picture of how he was going to once and for all eradicate the sin that held mankind captive and separated from God while at the same time allowing the person to go free. It was really a beautiful picture. Now, even in those days, people couldn't fathom, no more than we would have if we lived in those days, that it was going to be fulfilled in this person of God himself becoming the lamb, uh, as the scripture says, to take away our sin. But that's what God was doing because at that time, an animal's blood could not the remove sin. Could the, the animal's sin. blood could only cover the sin. By a person sacrificing, sacrificing purchasing, and raising, and sacrificing and a lamb and, and allowing that lamb to be, be slain for their sin, the person was saying, I am putting my trust not in my own goodness to be good enough before God. I am putting my trust in the sacrifice God has provided for me that one day will come. And so I'm putting my faith in God's work through this to cover my sin. And then one day we'll see in a moment the sacrifice, Jesus Christ, God's perfect replacement came. And what would God do on the cross as Jesus was hanging there, God literally took all the sin of the world, placed it on Jesus. And then in Jesus, all of his wrath came down to judge our sin. To judge our sin. Jesus took That's what happened. Jesus took the full of the force of, of the judgment and the wrath of God on our That's sin. Pretty That's pretty exciting. Years Isaiah prophesied 800 years before. All of us, like sheep, All of have, us, strayed like sheep we have, have strayed away. We have left own. God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him, that is Jesus, the sins, the sins of us all. And here's the important thing. In order for my sin as a human being to actually be removed, not just covered, but actually destroyed, washed away, the only replacement for me is another human being. An animal's blood can only cover it symbolically for the human that was to come. But it must be another human being to give his or her life for me in order for me to go free. 
Now, the we problem is, we, we tend to look at ourselves, we used the uh, adage before, that we judge we others judge by their actions, by but we judge ourselves by our intentions. Yeah. Don't we? Somebody does the smallest little thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Somebody so does the bad. smallest we're little thing and is, oh, they're the so bad, they're this and that, whatever. That. We do the same thing. Well, that's I didn't mean that. that. That's ourselves. not what I meant, is we justify our ourselves. Sin, so when it comes to our sin, we tend to think, well, I'm not that I'm bad of a person. I'm not as bad as somebody else or this other person. I haven't killed anybody or whatever. I apologize if you have killed somebody. But, you know, we always use that analogy. Okay, if you have, you can be forgiven. We know that. But we're so subjective in our judgments, right? We tend to justify anything we've done wrong. But the reality is only a person can actually be my replacement. If I'm in a prison cell uh, on death row and there's a guy in the next cell on death row and we become good friends, I can't say to the warden, hey, we've become good friends with these last couple of years. I really feel bad that he has to die. Listen, I would like to give my life in his place. Let him go free. What would the warden do? He'd laugh all the way back to the office. What do you mean? You're both on death row. You both committed the crime. You can't take his place. But hypothetically, if someone who was innocent of the crime came in and said, I am willing to pay, though I've not done the crime, for them, they could go free. That's how it works, at least in the cosmos, in God's economy. So, here's the issue. For that person to take my place would have to be a perfect, sinless human being. But here's the problem, Romans 5. We just read it earlier. The problem is the entire human race has sinned. Tell the person beside you, you Go sin. Ahead. They have they tell you not. Go they ahead, have they sin. have where they tell you or not. Every they have sin. That's what the scripture says. Every single one of us, that's what the scripture so, says. Here's what we need. So, here's we what we need. need another human being, we need another human just like being, us in the sense of flesh and blood, just like us in the sense world. of flesh and blood, born we into this world. We need another human being to represent us. But we also need someone, who is, also like need someone who is who like no God. Sin. Who has right. no sin. If you're in the cell next to me, right? it's not good enough. Because if you're in the cell next to me, it's not good enough. You have to be without sin in order to pay for my sin and for me so to go free. So we need a human being to represent us. We also need someone who is sinless is like God. God. What we need man. is a God man. Jesus, God became man to become the God man that we need. Can someone say thank you, Jesus? But you, you're, are you following me? That's what we need. If we don't have this God man to take our place, we pay for our own, sin. And, here's the, for our own sin. and here's the here's the reality: is we deserve to. We're not like God got you know good guys who got a bad rap. No, we are guilty we as charged. We don't deserve any mercy from God. We deserve hell. Absolutely, we deserve hell. That's why we say that we were saved. If you don't understand what you've been snatched from, you don't understand you've been saved. But when you understand what you have been delivered from, when you understand that when you step into eternity, you don't have to step into a fearful. You don't have to step into a petrified that you're going to step into a, the flames of hell. You can step into eternity knowing that Jesus is there waiting for you. And when you understand that, you realize what he has saved you from. And when you begin to fathom that in the smallest of detail, you understand why through eternity we will worship Jesus. <laughs> eternity won't be long enough. Because we will realize what we've been saved from and how great God's love is for me. Jesus suffered the punishment of my sin so I could be part. We used to sing a song many years ago that he paid a debt that he did not owe. I owed a debt that I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my and sins away. I and now song. I sing a brand Amazing new song. What is it? Grace. Amazing Christ grace. Jesus Christ Jesus paid the pay. debt that I could That's never pay. That. That's, That's why we sing that. That's what it means. Righteousness and peace, Righteousness have, kissed and peace have kissed at the cross of Jesus Christ. And the reason, we know, and the the reason we know that the sacrifice of Jesus was accepted was that when he drew his very last, that breath, that drew his very last breath, something miraculous took place that actually was written, recorded by secular historians as well as biblical historians, and it was this. In the temple, there's the holy place and the most holy place. Again, the most holy place is where the priest could come once a year to offer the blood for the, for the uh, sins of his people. The holy of holies was the place where God's presence dwelt among his people. No man could go in there other than the, the high priest. The curtain that separated those two chambers was 60 feet high from ground, was 60 to, feet high from ground it was to, to ceiling. Feet wide. It was 30 it was feet wide. It was four it inches thick. It weighed 8,000 pounds. 
and took as many as 300 to men it, to roll it up and carry it. That's, how, had thick this That's how thick this curtain it was. And it had to be. It had to keep man out. It kept God inside, you might say, though he's omnipresent. When Jesus drew his last breath, on the, cross, drew his last breath on the cross, we are told in the scriptures, we are told by secular historians what happened. In the temple, the curtain was miraculously torn. Not from the bottom from the to the top, top no from the top all where no man could reach, down to the all the what way down God to the bottom. God what was God doing? God was proving to mankind Jesus that because died Jesus died for us and his sacrifice, died for us died and his sacrifice was accepted by God, the barrier between us and God was once and for all torn apart and we have free access into the presence of God. And that's why the book of Hebrews says that we are able to come boldly into the presence of God in times of need because of what Jesus has done for us. It is only if you believe the lies of the devil, the accuser, that you don't go in. There's nothing to hinder you. If there's sin, confess it. Get it out of the way. Get the enemy out of your life and say, Jesus, I know I don't deserve it, but you love me and I love your love and I'm coming home. Here I come. Into your presence. We don't have to worry about getting dead because of the blood of Jesus that covers our lives and has made us pure. Okay, real quick. The second prophetic enactment that points to Jesus is the story of Israel's deliverance from slavery in Egypt. You kind of wonder sometimes, why did you allow them to go into, into slavery and all that kind of stuff would happen? I believe what God was doing was he was creating this, this drama for the whole world to see. In the deliverance, if you can imagine millions upon millions of people, Jews, that were delivered out of Egypt. As they were leaving that nation, the Bible says they plundered Egypt, not with weapons, but the Egyptians by the time of the 10th plague, they just gave them wealth to get rid of them. Go, get out of here because your God's destroying us. And so they leave, they plundered Egypt, and they left, and it was symbolic of the mass exodus from the kingdom of darkness that God was going to work in the human race through the cross of Jesus Christ. Literally, we don't see it today, but I don't know what the numbers are, but I know there are at least tens of thousands every single day of human beings that are being set free from the kingdom of darkness, being led out of darkness into the light of God's kingdom. We also know, I won't take great time to go into it, you can Google it, it's an interesting study, but there were 10 plagues that God used. 10 is a number of completeness. What God was saying is that Israel, Egypt rather, did not just have plagues, but it was completely plagued. Like there was nothing Every left to play. Every part of their society was impacted by a plague. And the reason there was 10 plagues was because every single plague, it wasn't arbitrary, every single plague was a deliberate uh, move of God, declaration of God that he is greater from ev than every demonic Egyptian God that people believed in. And so when he was, you know, uh, turning the water into blood in the Nile River, what was he saying? He was saying, I am greater than your Nile God. Then your river God. Saying, when there was life, he was saying, I'm greater, I can't remember the, the God's name. I'm greater than the God of dust. I'm greater than the crocodile God. I'm greater than this God and that God. Every single plague. And so God not only, not only demonstrated his power over every false God in, the, God in the land, but when he led them out by the millions, again, he was showing us how great his salvation is. Now, what does that have to do with the cross? Now, what does that have to do with the cross? It was through the cross, the Bible says in Colossians It was through the cross, the Bible says in Colossians 2. God Read this with me. God stripped the spiritual rulers and powers of their authority. With the cross, he won the victory and showed the world that they were powerless. Who's powerless? The spiritual rulers and powers. Through the cross, hear me, friends. God, through Jesus Christ, completely plundered the powers of hell. The powers of hell have no power over anyone who is serving under the lordship of Jesus Christ. You are not just a servant of Jesus Christ. You become a son of God. You become a daughter of God. You get all the wealth. All the inheritance is yours. All the spiritual weapons, they are yours. It should not be contest. It doesn't mean we don't have conflict. It doesn't mean there's not battle. But when we know who we are, we don't listen to the enemy. We don't take our cues from him. Even if our natural circumstances seem to agree with what the enemy is saying, we still say, enemy, in Jesus' name, you are a liar. This may be my situation right now, but this is not my destiny. 
Greater is he who is in me than you who come against me. And it's time for the people of God to understand that not only are we saved and freed from hell, we have taken with us the riches of hell. I think it's Isaiah 44 that says the Lord will give you the treasures of darkness. What's he saying? He won't only set you free from the darkness. He will take the things the enemy is intended for your destruction. He will redeem those things, and he will use them to plunder hell by reaching other people through you. That is the power of our God. And it really is time for the people of God to wake up. It's time for the people of God to get back into the Word of God to know how to use this spiritual sword, to know who we are, to know what our mission is, to know what the abundant life really is. It's not about just getting saved and going to heaven, as glorious as it is. The abundant life is that we get to partner with the Holy Spirit in bringing a whole bunch of people with us. We get to have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. Because we understand the power and the truth that we have. And so we need to get some backbone as the people of God. We need to get back on mission and realize how much fun it is to actually partner with Jesus Christ, confront the powers of darkness, see them overthrown, and see people get free. There's no greater high than that, my friends. There's no greater thrill at all than the Spirit of God working through you. The Lord says, I didn't come to bring you religion. I came to bring you a demonstration of power and the Spirit of God, so that people's faith would not be in the religion, but in the power of God that they see. Well, I've got to wind down here real quick. Let me just give you this real, really quickly, and we'll, we'll wrap up. But in the deliverance of the people of Israel from Egypt, God said on the 10th plague, the final one, is that death is going to sweep through the nation, the entire nation. Every firstborn son of every family is going to die. That's the judgment. And it wasn't just an arbitrary judgment. God actually turned Pharaoh's judgment on himself. Pharaoh, who was believed to be the God of all gods in Egypt, above all the other gods, he said to Moses, if you step foot in here again, if I see your face, I'm going to kill you. God says, oh yeah? Well, by the declaration of your own mouth, I'm going to do the same to your people. The first oldest son of every family is going to die, unless, here's the grace of God. God could have just said, you've enslaved my people for hundreds of years. I'm done with all of you. I'm taking my people, we're going home. He didn't do that. He said, even in your sin and wickedness and your pagan beliefs, if you will do this thing, you can be saved. He said, death is going to move through your nation. He said, on the 10th day of the month, I want you to take a lamb. If you will take a lamb into your home, get to know that lamb, love that lamb over the four days, your children is a pet to them. You're, what's God doing is creating attachment. So when that lamb does die, they realize something they loved actually gave its life for them. It was their fault. And so he says, do that on the 10th day. On the 14th day, I want you to sacrifice that animal, take its blood, and put it, brush it on the doorposts. He said, when death is moving through the land, if I see the blood on your door, I will pass over you, and I will not harm you. Now, here's the beautiful thing. That word Passover, we tend to think in the English language, we get this image of God is moving over the land to kill the firstborn. And if he sees the blood, he'll just skip over that house and go to the next one. That's backwards. Here's the actual image in the Hebrew language. Death, judgment, deserving judgment is moving through the land. But God says as death is moving through the nation, as I look, whatever house I see, the word Passover doesn't mean skip over. The word Passover means I will hover over that home. Do you see the difference? God says, when I see the blood, I will come and hover over the home and protect everyone, Israelite or Egyptian, that have put their trust in me, in the blood of the lamb. I will spare them. And that's what he did. And when Israel left Egypt by the millions, they also took a great population of Egyptians who put their trust in Jesus Christ. Because God loves Egyptians too. God loves all mankind. He wants all mankind to be saved. Jesus said, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And friends, the miracle that we see God perform in delivering his people from Egypt, it pales in comparison to the rescue of one human being from sin. The Bible says, if Jesus has set you free, you're free indeed. One of Jesus' followers named Mark made a powerful observation about Jesus' death on the cross. In chapter 15, Mark writes, it was nine in the morning when they crucified Jesus. 
Verse 33, at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God the Father had to turn his face from the sin upon his son. Verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Why is Mark so concerned about the precise timing of Jesus' death? It's because in temple worship, the lamb would be brought before the people to be inspected, to say this lamb is pure, it, it is good to be sacrificed. And then it would be sacrificed. At three o'clock, when the animal was sacrificed, a priest would go up to the corner of the temple wall, stand on the wall, and with the trumpet, the shofar, the ram's horn, he would blow it. And by blowing that trumpet, it literally meant that not only was the sacrifice done and accepted, but they used these words, it is finished. That's what the priests were saying. And so Mark is very precise in letting us know that when Jesus hung on the cross, remember Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down freely. Remember the Bible says that when Jesus gave up his spirit, he was in control the whole time. And exactly at three o'clock, when he's drawn his last breath, what is happening? The shofar sounds in the background. And as the shofar is being blown, and the priests are announcing that the, that the lamb has been sacrificed and accepted, what does Jesus cry in a loud voice? It is finished. It is finished. I've done it. You don't have to add to it. It is complete. Your sins are paid for. You can now go free. Righteousness and peace have kissed. God did what no man could ever imagine. And he did it because he loves us so much that he does not want to spend eternity without any of us. And hear me, my friends, not only does he not want to spend eternity without us, he doesn't want to spend eternity without anybody outside these walls. There's not a single person, race, color, creed, religion, doesn't matter who they are. He died for every single one of them. He said it is finished for every single one inside these walls and outside these walls. 2 Corinthians 5, God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. But if there's one thing the Passover shows us, the original Passover, is that it's only by applying the blood of the sacrifice to your life that you can be saved. That you can be saved from the just punishment that not only you deserve. Hear me, friends. It's the only way you can be saved from the just punishment that awaits you. The devil will try to fill your life with distractions so that you never think of eternity. But God in his grace sometimes will give you a close call to wake you up and make you realize life is brief. Maybe it's a pronouncement from a doctor. Maybe it's a car accident. Whatever it may be. And God will say, I spared you. Listen, wake up. There's an eternity waiting you for you. And you're either going to spend it with me or you're going to spend it separated from me. But you need to know this. There is a hell. And God says, I don't send anyone to hell. The only person that goes to hell is the person who says, God, I know what you've done for me, but I don't care. I want to live life on my terms. And God says, okay, it breaks my heart. But you need to realize then you will have to pay for your own sin. And the payment for your sin is death. It is eternal separation from me. If you don't want me in this life, I have to honor your free will. But you won't get me in the next life either. And you won't like what you see in the next life. It's so terrifying. That's why I was willing to die for you, to free you from the consequence of your sin. But you have to choose to believe. You have to choose to receive. It's not about joining a church. It's not about becoming religious. It's between you and God the Father. You know whether or not you know him. And if you don't know him, you need to know this morning, he has made a way for you to know him. And it's through what Jesus has done for you that no other person, no other religion even imagined but God devised a plan to save you from your sin, to meet justice, but also to be able to show you mercy and to let you go free. But real freedom is not to go back to your old way of life, doing what you want. That's what got you in the mess in the first place. Real freedom is in Jesus. It's actually in a loving relation with the God who made you, who knows how life works the best, and who has, he says, a plan for you to bring you hope and to give you a future. That's his heart toward you. Would you bow your head with me? I know I've gone long this morning. 
But every head bowed, I just want to give you the opportunity before we come to the Lord's table in conclusion this morning. I'm not going to prolong it. You know whether or not you need Jesus, whether or not you want Jesus. But if you're here this morning and saying, Pastor, I don't re want religion, but I want Jesus. If you realize your need this morning, you just raise your hand. I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm just giving the opportunity right now to know that a shadow of a doubt in your heart that your sins are forgiven and that you can be a child of God. Is there anyone at all? We may all know the Lord this morning, and that's wonderful.